everybody, I'm Andrew Chard. And I'm Tobias Pangin. And we're from View from the Gutters. We're very excited about everything that we're doing right now, and we want to make more stuff. And so, for that reason, we've launched our very own Patreon campaign. And if you don't know anything about Patreon, it's basically a website where independent creators can create campaigns for people to spend them small amounts of money mm -hmm. every month. Kind of like a Kickstarter, but just ongoing. Yeah. Uh, for like a buck, two bucks a month, we get the money that we need to make more content, mm -hmm. make better content with better equipment, uh, do interviews, go to conventions, yeah. do more stuff like that, uh, create new stuff for our listeners, uh, swag, things like that. Yeah, we're always going to keep our content free, but this is a nice way for us to like up the quality of all the shows that we're doing, because we want to make the absolute best content that we can possibly make. We want to make another hundred episodes. We want to make you know more bonus shows, more content. And so, at the one dollar level, you basically get into our Patreon like family, and you're going to get access to our Patreon page, and you'll continue to get all the content for free, as everyone will, but if you are able to donate it a little higher level than the one dollar level we're gonna do something to give back to you guys just as yeah we're gonna as our patrons like special behind the scenes content mm -hmm. uh chats with the hosts stuff like that just yeah a way to say thank you and engage with those people who support us the most and yeah give something back to you guys for helping us out so much yeah and we want to say thank you to everyone that's been listening thus far thank you if you're just joining us and definitely check out our patreon and hopefully you guys can help us continue to make the best content we can possibly make yeah so just follow the link and uh we'll see you over at our patreon page guys thanks so much thanks everybody view from the gutters episode 101 <laughs> Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Flashpoint, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 114.12. What, a 102? 101. 101. One oh Uno. <laughs> Come on, you this is like the easiest so possible episode I, to remember. No, <laughs> the la you, last one was easier. Yeah, because you recorded a now episode, so that I got confused. That's yeah. fair. We've I've you know this is the thing is like you guys record these and I've recorded like four shows in between and so I forget what has happened like in that space time loop of like i've recorded shows that aren't coming out till the end of december so i had to like or not december end of january no the end of december you've got an entire year's yeah. worth of shit you have a year to worth. wait for that show to come out one oh, teasing it now one all right teasing 101 it. i'm andrew chard i'm joe brady I wish you would knock that off. Like, I honestly do. Like, it bothers me that you do that. And we I know, know that's why you that's do that. That's the only reason he does it. You know that. You I'm Tobias Pancho. You have to know it. I'm Brent Gillahan Eddie. I'm just so flustered by all of that. I'm Cade Reynolds. Uh, and we're talking about uh, the the seminal epic. Rolling Stone can I, album Flashpoint. Can I, can I make a comment real quick? Yes. I'm not done with it yet. But I was I've been listening to a hundred point now on the way here. Oh, okay. This, I thought you today. mean you weren't done with Flashpoint. I was like, no, 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 five no, no, issues. No, no. <laughs> and I just want to say, first of all, gentlemen and Kaylee, play nice. My yeah. God, that episode started with a giant. I really you what you don't yelling. know is there's twenty minutes yeah, missing from that really episode. Lovely. I'm sure there probably. And, uh, yeah. I think of it as one hundred point. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm interested to see what else comes up. But I did want yeah. to make one comment about some or two comments about something first of all is maybe we need to do a back matter about comics and academia because i'm inter interested in kaylee's yes. observations but i want to say as a matter of general principle the one thing that i noticed and i tried to make this comment during our watchman episode was that watchman's been talked about a lot in the scholarship but there's not a lot of scholarship so i don't know that i would use that as a good basis for claiming its importance right because i feel like kaylee really like elbowed in with that being like everybody talks about it right. but everybody talks about it but about american comics and one narrow view about superhero comicdom there's mm -hmm. a lot more comics out there there's globally locally all that stuff so right i think we could totally tear that apart and i just wanted to say that 
Yeah. So if you're interested, listeners out there, let us I, know and maybe we'll do a back matter. Totally we'll, uh, we'll do a back matter. Joe won't be invited, and we'll get <laughs> Brent and uh, Kaylee, and mm-hmm. also uh, I'll try to get uh, Kelly from Out of the Fridge, yeah. who's a lit major. Yeah, there you go. Who also took like lit classes on comics in college. Uh, well, I had already been planning a back matter. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, academics. Oh, of, did, were you? Of, of comics. Am I yes, stepping on your toes? A little of bit. Of a show that you well, created? Well, because I have a... I, I don't want to talk too much about it, because there was somebody... I wanted to get because I had a faculty member at Evergreen who uh, has uh, focused on. I don't know exactly what his degree, oh, um, what level of his degree is, but he has focused specifically on uh, graphic sequential art for a while. And the class mm-hmm. I took with him, while I feel like I kind of I feel incredibly guilty about it because I didn't feel like I did 16 credits worth of work, was incredibly informative in that way. And he was a wealth of knowledge, and I really 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 want to try and get him on mm. the show and talk to him about it because it's something that i'm interested in and i think that um i i you know i i would be interested in in having uh a conversation about the scholarly impact there seems to be less Boston. yelling yeah I, and i don't i don't yell on back matter or i very rarely yell on back matter then why do you yell here i yell okay i yell when I'm, just asking. I'm just asking don't yell at me when i yell at back matter i'm usually yelling about what we're doing. like i'm pretty sure i yell on tarot but it's fucking tarot like, keep, keep in mind that the last time that i wasn't on an episode you guys spent the entire hour talking about puppet sodomy which is a way that is it was beautiful and amazing and one of my favorite things ever yeah okay, what does that have to do with the yelling part the nothing yelling Toby part, just thinks the show uh, yeah. gets worse when he's not yeah. there oh, okay. clearly it no, gets I'm just better saying, <laughs> the choices between Joe yelling and me not being here um, but I he think. wasn't yelling at you. He was clearly yelling at Kaylee. I don't. I honestly, I don't yell as much as I did in the earlier shows. Like I'm, I'm, I try to be a lot more thoughtful. Yeah, in your old age, you've really calmed down. I've tried. Well, I, you know, I want to be a little bit more thoughtful. I don't want to be the guy that just screams down dissenters. But sometimes dissenters need to be screamed at. Hmm. Uh, and which is really, which gives me a really nice segue into Flashpoint because I know that people are expecting me to scream about this book and I'm not gonna because well, I just well, fucking, uh, as far as you know, I, well, yeah, I mean, I may not, but, uh, I, I, well, okay. As it stands now, <laughs> if we, per, if we talk only about the book, I just don't, I read this whole thing last night and I was like, I put it down and I was like, what? Like. Oh. What the fuck did I just read? It was like... I've read it twice this felt like in the last week. Flashpoint to me feels like... And I promised myself something, too. And I promised this for you, because the last time we talked about a Jeff Johns book, we we had a screaming match. Who'd you promise yeah. it to? <clears throat> uh, to me. To me to yes, yes. Uh, to Chard. To I'm sorry. Me and Chard. Uh, infamous 50.3... Uh, infinite infinite crisis, crisis. And we, we had a screaming match. So I said... I promised myself... Today I've been thinking about it all day... I would not talk about the things... I, w- I would first of all talk about the problems I have with this book without mentioning its author. And when I did mention its author, I would bring up times where I thought he did the things he was trying to do in Flashpoint better. Okay, so <clears throat> I was the one who recommended this book. Yes. And... No, wait, Toby's supposed to... Toby's supposed what? to lead in. He's supposed to say... No, 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 okay. no, no, no. You recommended this book. <laughs> <laughs> what you... I'm taking the initiative here. <laughs> I would have rather really messed that up because for some reason in my mind, you pitched this brand. No, I just, be, I just secured victory. You. I just secured victory for it actually being talked about. Yeah, yes. everyone brought a book that they thought Joe wouldn't vote for. That's right. <laughs> That's what we did last week. Wow. Um, but I, I, I am very interested to hear... Uh, everyone's opinion on this yeah sorry okay. i didn't mean to cut you off i just so had to make that the joke. last jeff john's book we talked about infinite crisis i mm-hmm. had some very unpleasant things to say mm-hmm. um because it was one of the times i realized that i could be i it was possible for me to hate a book mm-hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> that's when i learned that i hate <laughs> i too could hate the comics the summer <laughs> of 2013 was when I first learned I could hate. <laughs> um, <laughs> the year that Kate that, so, came into the full blossom of his womanhood yeah. and learned no, to hate for the first that time. That was the year I met Kate Reynolds. God, with, with Slam Bradley, Slam. no. Uh, uh, Never again. I'm sorry for interrupting Kate. Please continue. The worst voice. No so, wonder Kate doesn't want to talk as much during the episode. Look at what happens when he starts crying. <laughs> Poor guy. Okay, so I went into this book not expecting very much. 
And I got to the end, and I was like, huh. <laughs> and I read it again. I actually really liked this book. <laughs> That's not surprising, because I went into this book expecting to hate it, and I left it going... Oh, I didn't get very much out of that because there's nothing that there's that's, like nothing that's there. funny because yeah. I went into this book expecting to go, eh, that was a thing, and I hate Whoa, it. Okay, <laughs> so apparently this is this is so nobody got to what me. they expected out of it. Yeah, I really, I did. Was like, <laughs> it was exactly what I thought it was going like, to be. It's like uh, like apologist reboot cannon fodder. Like I like it because it's half. Elseworlds, and like I mentioned before, like I was like, I was reading Flashpoint as it was coming out, and I was going, I don't understand why everyone's so upset about this. Like, there's nothing really inherently that wrong with Flashpoint. If you... And then I realized I wasn't actually reading Flashpoint one through five. Right. Yeah, we I talked was about that. Only reading the side stories, which are Elseworlds yep. that just explore the universe of Flashpoint. Yeah. Right. Which I did I found, read uh, like, Lois Lane and the Resistance. Yeah. Like they're not bad no. like they're kind of interesting and like i love elseworld stories and I, i'll like forgive a lot about an elseworld story just for the novelty of it i'll be like okay well this i mean but see, maybe not the greatest thing in the world but like it's cool to see these characters in a new fun interesting light well if you and get, here is one of the things if you just read flashpoint one through five and take it completely out of the the context that was clearly not in the trade mm-hmm. it, it is an elseworld story that's yeah. all it oh, is absolutely. it opens with him Going into an alternate universe. Yeah. And it ends with him coming out of it. It's l- like, there's like four pages that aren't in that universe. Uh, so it basically is an Elseworlds story. No, I, I mean, agree. I, th- I think that... Uh, I think the difference is that when you read an Elseworlds story, it's... it's uh, and maybe this is just me, but like I feel like I was getting into comics in the age of Elsewhere. And and like or else worlds and it was like license it was like creative license to do cool things you know mm-hmm. and like maybe not all like we said maybe not all of them were successful at that point I would say most of them but were. I think most I, I I think they were all interesting like reimagining yeah. Batman that gets found by the Waynes that's like. You mean Superman? Oh uh, yeah, Superman. I'm sorry. It's been a long day, <laughs> as it normally is on the end of Monday. Um, and if this, I, I really feel like, if you had given this book like two more issues, called it an Elseworlds, and had like, I don't even think you need to have Jeff Johns not write it, but just have somebody kind of behind him cleaning things up and tightening up, yeah. you would have had a halfway decent story. Yeah. But it, it really like feeling like reading it, it feels like. He knew where he had to get through, and I, I it's almost like he made up the stuff to get there on his well, way yeah. to work in the morning. It was like, he grabbed some toast and a cup of coffee, and like on the subway on the way to work, he was like, okay, I'm going to do this in this issue. Because it never really feels fleshed out. Like, I can't even bring myself to be angry about it, because there's not enough there to be angry at, right. you know? It's like... There's not even there enough there to be bad. It's just very, very bare bones. And like... I think, as weird it is to say, there are some really interesting ideas. I like the idea of, like, uh, Captain Marvel or Shazam being, like, broken into, like, like six or se- uh, what, six, 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 seven. Seven. Six. I like the whole He-Man Shazam, man, like, with, with uh, Taki Tani and, like, the battle, battle armor. Bat and, armor. Like, and all the but, stars and stuff. Yeah, like, I mean, at least that's somewhat interesting. And I, I think there, I, I think that he was telling like three different stories here, none of which he actually got around to telling. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say like, this is also an event book. Like I think that's important to note. And I think that for two reasons, one, because a lot of what happens in the event takes place in extraneous miniseries, like many modern DC events. And I, we've expressed our like, dislike of that pretty heavily on the show and i i tend to agree with that it's like if it's important enough to be relevant to the event like it should be in the main book yeah and if you want to revisit the world of flashpoint later with another elseworld story to tell like frankenstein and the agents of shade or whatever that miniseries was yeah. i don't remember what it was called um then you should do that later like you should not put that in there but if we look at the really like in my mind successful dc event books they share something in common, which is their density and their length. Like, 
I think that uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths works because it is not only is it an extremely dense book, but it's also 13 issues. So there's like it's a world ending book, but they have the time to make things seem important. Like they're able to add weight to situations by creating drama and creating moments in time. This is five issues. Like there's yeah. not enough time to make me care. But fifty two really is literally fifty two <laughs> issues of making you care about stuff. You know, Sinestro Core War is two trade paperbacks. <clears throat> the Kryptonian um what is that Superman, that big Superman event. New World Krypton. Of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. War for Krypton and all that. Yeah, like that's a huge there's like two sixteen part series that are in that or something. So I think a lot of why this book fails for me is it's like it's done so quickly. There's n- it's pretty cardboard yeah. as far as the story goes. Like it's so flat. Well, what's interesting to me about it is I, you know, you would think. Well, so if I remember the business side of things correctly, mm-hmm. it's post this that Jeff Johns gets promoted to <clears throat> head of creative content or whatever, or is it before this? I believe uh, it's, it's after this. It's after yeah, this. it's like really soon. <clears throat> so after. Well, it's like this happened, and then they launched the new Fifty Two, and, and that's he when the, whatever. Yeah. So because one of the things that occurred to me is so, mm-hmm. and I have to back up here. So here's how I approach this book. Mm-hmm. I've had it sitting, all of its extraneous pieces, like you know all. I think it's like 60 issues if you do all the sides. 61, stuff. I 61. think. Yeah, there's a lot. So I sat on it, and I decided when it was announced that I wanted to watch the Warner Brothers animated Flashpoint Paradox JLA movie first. Because I've noticed something about those those movies lately. There's a couple of them where I feel like they truncate the story in a way that I'm like, ah, the comic was better. But there was a couple, uh, and in particular the one that comes to mind is the Red Hood one, mm-hmm. that feel way better. Partially because they're not tied to the comic continuity part. So there's right. no like Superboy Prime punching reality. It's just Jason Todd gets thrown into a Lazarus pit. Have a nice day. Right. Uh, and so it's like they have an opportunity to like tweak the things that maybe tying something to continuity in the monthly model like hampers a book down. Agreed. So I watched Flashpoint Paradox first and I was really satisfied with that as a Justice League movie mm-hmm. and primarily a Barry Allen movie. And then I went back and I read this and it was really striking to me like how much or how little of the main five like the 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 video itself is mostly issues one through five of flashpoint but you can drop visual notes about the some of the stuff that's developed in the broader flashpoint world in in the animation that you can't in the comic in the same way Mm -hmm. it doesn't have the same import and so i found myself feeling like you did shard where i'm like this feels flat and kind of strange and so then i kind of tore into the the other issues and Mm -hmm. stuff and was like okay well here's some of this stuff but I, in, I know Tobai and I have talked about this, even on the show, in little chunks about our feelings regarding Civil War mm-hmm. with, from Marvel. Whereas I feel like Civil War, for the most part, reads okay by itself. I think Flashpoint doesn't yeah, very I would, well. I would say that Civil War, like, if you don't read the tie-ins, like, you still get the <laughs> yeah, majority Yeah, you still get of... basically what's happening. But Flashpoint feels like, I feel like it feels really dull. dull. And I know I, there are two things that I, well, there are three things that I was thinking about. First is... It would, it's weird that Jeff Johns would put himself in the position of having to cut himself short. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if there was kind of a Faustian bargain in so much that I get the impression from the, all, this, all the build up to it that this was kind of Jeff Johns like big Brian Michael Bendis moment where he was going to have basically creative reign over the DC universe. He would kind of guide everybody at, like it was his kind of big sketch vision thing with some input from some other people. But kind of like Bendis did with New Avengers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With that whole kind of tapestry of the universe and the background mm. thing. And it got cut. I feel like it got cut short. And it's specifically because nothing about this even hints at the New 52 until the last, what, four pages? My- when Pandora inserts herself into him running backwards through time. And is like, oh, well, there were three timelines. Like, that is completely... Nothing about that has anything to do with the Flashpoint part. That part did seem very janky. And my understanding, and I was trying to find where I saw this and I couldn't do it, was that the continuity reboot was supposed to happen at the end of Final Crisis, Mm. which would make a lot of sense because the universe basically ends and is rebooted. Like Superman restarts the universe. And And which is why the 52 and one year later came about. Well, that's, no, no, no. That, no. Was, all that was before Final Crisis. Final Crisis. That was after Infinite oh, Crisis. Oh, that was... Okay, right. So Final Crisis happened, and I guess, like, they weren't ready to do it yet. And so, like, the universe continued for another, like, six or eight months or whatever. Right. And then it kind of feels like they pulled Flashpoint out of their assholes. Yeah. And they're like, 
okay, this like kind of flash thing that we had an idea about doing, this is now going to be the mechanism by which we reboot our universe. Well, and it's it's really telling <clears throat> that you have a relaunch of two characters that were <clears throat> Vertigo characters into the New 52 with Constantine and, and uh, Swamp Thing both getting their own monthly series for six months and then rebooting again in New 52. Yeah, I mean, yeah. everything it's about like the they business did, like, side of that seems start, so stop. weird. Yeah. So it, strange. Yeah. It seems very much like... DC had decided on this new thing. They needed a way to get there, right? And I think they could have done more of a one year later thing. And I think, I almost wonder if that would have been a more in- interesting choice. Just reset everything and have maybe the first year of stories in your major titles be piecing together what happened, right? Well, some of it is that. And, and uh, yeah, I know that there is, in some of the books, there is that. But then I feel very much that what this feels like to me is I need to get from A to B. Mm-hmm. I know where B is, and I know I want to use the Flash to get there. Right. And it just feels very... It, like, I remember reading Blackest Night, and while I really, really didn't like it, and I thought there were a lot of missed cues and a lot of, like, build-up to nothing, which I think Jeff Johns sometimes has a problem with, where I think he gets overly excited about what he's reading, and then the payoff is not... And it's not, it's not necessarily that the payoff isn't great. It's that at the point he gets to the payoff, it can't possibly be as good as what he's been leading up to. But, like, even in Darkest or Blackest Night, there, and I've talked about this before, there are great moments in that book. Mm-hmm. There's some real, where, where you read it and it, it makes it even more frustrating because you can't write him off because you're like, he understands these things. But in Flashpoint, it's like totally devoid of that. Well, there are no moments. See what's in. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, it reeks of the same lack of editorial foresight that has crippled the New 52 ever since. Right, right. My my counter-argument is, I think there actually are amazingly good beats in New Fla- and Flashpoint, and what proved it to me is the film, The Flashpoint Paradox. Whether it's a function of Jeff being overwhelmed by a bunch of other things, or that somebody else <laughs> needed to come in to really grab what was great about Flashpoint and give it room... There are some things in the Flashpoint Paradox that play really, really well. And I was disappointed to read in those five issues that they weren't handled as well. Like, one of the things that I think was so great about that... Cause, so, in the Flashpoint Paradox, the way this all comes about is... The opening scene is uh, rogues are... The rogues, uh, uh, the Flash's rogues are, like, robbing a museum or doing something strange. And basically, Barry Allen shows up like he always does and is fighting them. And then it turns out that they're actually operating on the on the behalf of Hunter Zolomon. Or, uh, um... Yvonne Thon. Yvonne Thon. Right. So, he basically creates the unwinnable scenario for Barry Allen. Right. Justice League shows up, helps him basically win that... win the day, and it sets the emotional tone. Like, Barry Allen always manages to win, except Barry Allen then is reflecting that there was one time that he's never been fast enough, and that was his mother. So, they anchor right then and there. Like, he's got this really good pathos for doing that whole thing mm-hmm. where he kind of makes a bad decision right and so then like so there's just a little bit more context into it and like the the revelation of the of of zoom as like the main architect of this whole thing right uh and it's in, and like the way they approach it for the rest of that movie really gives the event more weight to me because it's not just like oh barry did a thing and like it, like there is still this exploration of like the world is wrong we need to fix it but there's right. still this kind of underlying current of but this is this is barry allen being tested by his greatest foe like that's the undercurrent that's given the entire right. film right so there's that and then there's all the actual like character decisions it's thomas wayne not bruce wayne superman was locked in a bunker he wasn't let go like some of those things are i think are really cool ideas oh yeah but the other thing that was weird about the execution of the graphic of the of the series i don't think andy kubert is in any way a good artist for this no. like i think like sometimes you have to pick certain kinds of artists to give something a certain flavor i like the cuberts and like man of steel sometimes because it makes things feel gritty and raw and like it's like wow power all over the place because their pencils are kind of well andy's in particular are, like really mm-hmm. chunky and weird yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but it doesn't make this book i think is supposed to be kind of like both grand and then like a testament to like the her heroism of of barry allen and it, i don't get that feeling from the art yeah like it feels weirdly frazzled in this way that i can't put my finger on and the biggest thing about it was like they made certain decision design decisions in the flashpoint paradox like wonder woman looks much more like wonder woman in the flashpoint paradox right and mm-hmm. one of the crowning achievements i think of of like really setting up this 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 situation where she's clearly wonder woman but taken to her furthest extreme as far as like support of her amazonian nature is that uh, 
you know, in the in the series, she's wearing um, Mira Mira's helmet, right? This right. kind of strange. We've never seen it before in the movie. She's wearing Mira's crown, the crown we all know from years of DC continuity. Right. So that packs a really different punch to me. Right. Yeah. When you've got somebody who looks much more like the Grecian Amazon Wonder Woman, you know, with like the plates and like the armor, but it's still clearly her with this badass sword and Mira's fucking crown on her head. You're like, holy shit! Like she is not fucking around. And like the, the even the way they bring that hole up, right? Like they're like it's shown through kind of a flashback that basically. Basically, Amazon and Atlantis were going to basically make peace with each other. And clearly part of that was that Arthur had to sleep with Diane and right. like, have sex. But he was still married to Mira. And Mira basically gives her the stink eye and tries to kill her. And Diane, like, takes her down. But this is all, like, very clearly shown in the context of this unfolding narrative. Right. So you're like, okay, this is, this is as much about... Like, so, like, there's this thing where it's like, okay, Aquaman can be amazing. He has the might of Atlantis behind him. But Wonder Woman can be amazing. She has the might of the Amazons. These characters aren't just awesome because of their superpowers. They're right. awesome because of all these other things. Right. And, like, there's even a scene in the in the movie that I don't think was in the series where at one point um, Aquaman is, is like, torturing somebody. And they're, they're like, you know, what are you going to do to me? And he's like, I've got microbes like eating your brain or like some crazy thing but like it was just like all of these kind of poignant points that were sort of brought up in the book are way better executed in the movie to the point that at the end when barry brings back thomas wayne's letter like even the layout of that scene in the you know in the in the in the comics like barry turns over the letter and then like bruce drops his cowl then he unfolds it in front of barry and like all this stuff and then barry's and then bruce is like you know you're an amazing messenger you know you're like you know, or whatever, Barry. But like, even in the animation, Batman goes off to the side. He does not let Barry see that he drops his cowl until like Barry happens to stop as he's running away. Right. And then it's only in that moment where Barry has hesitated, you know, and how often does Barry hesitate? Right. That Bruce basically takes his head to the side and says, you're an amazing messenger, Barry. And Barry just leaves. Like, like even that, I think carries like Bruce Wayne more legitimately. Like he wouldn't like, take his cow down and be like, hey, Barry, thanks. He, like, mm-hmm. would only kind of barely acknowledge the fastest man alive as the va- fastest man alive was leaving, and Barry wouldn't, like, stay there in his face. He would basically only hesitate as he left. Like, there's just tons of weird little things like that where I'm like, wow, you guys got everything right about this concept and how, and the emotional beats of that story. Right. But, and so clearly they were there, but it just well, was executed and so I, strangely I This is, to me, something I've always wondered about comic books because we have this very strong tradition in western comics specifically of superhero comics where it's like you have the writer and then you have the artist and then you have the uh colorist colorist and the inker and the and then the editor all kind of oversees everything but there have been several examples where writing teams or partnerships like are actually stronger than like either one of them on their own and i feel like that where that may not always be appropriate for weekly or monthly comics like i kind of wish for event comics they They would would get like their four best writers in the room together right sit them down and bash out the event for like months they they did right like that's what 52 52 was so good i totally agree well when you have when you have one writer kind of left his own devices. And especially like, you know, it's clear that Jeff Johns has a very strong affinity for the flash. And it's like, I have a very strong affinity for the flash. I understand not that this flash, but well, no, not Barry Allen, but I mean, I know that I would not want to sit down and write a story about a character. I was close to without having somebody very closely edit me because I know myself well enough to know that I'm going to want them to be as badass as possible. And I'm, wanting, I'm going to want to cut out anything that makes them... Like, I have an image in my head. And that image may not be the most conducive to telling the story that I need to tell. And I... I agree with you, but I don't. I don't even know that the errors in this are so much about like he he likes Barry Allen too much because uh, no. he really likes to drag Barry through the mud. Well, he did he, it yeah. in oh, yeah. he did it in Rebirth, Rebirth, and he did it in this in like way too similar a way. To you, me. I almost get the feeling that for some reason Jeff Johns feels like a, a defining characteristic. Like this is the thing for me. I love Green Lantern Rebirth because mm-hmm. I feel like at its core, like. Jeff Johns gets something about Hal Jordan that only some of the best writers of Hal Jordan have gotten. Right. Like, he just understands something about, like, this hot dog, you know, will-based guy who's, you know, 
you know, got a heart of gold in his center, but it's kind of a cocky prick. Like, there's something about him that I feel like he gets mm-hmm. that I think that he thinks he gets about Barry Allen, but I don't think he really does. Or he, or at the very minimum, I'll phrase it this way, he has a very different perception than I do of what makes Barry Allen good. Yeah. Right. And I think you're right. Like, he seems to love just, like, kicking that guy to the... Well, and the and thing, dragging him through the mud and the thing and is like Barry Allen this shit already happened to him yes. like Barry has had the shit kicked out of him for years and years and years and years in the Silver Age like he was like nothing ever went right for that guy like right. Iris was constantly like I'm gonna leave you unless you show up for dates on time and then like right. he had to reveal to her that he was the Flash after they got married and then he gets framed for her murder by Professor Zoom like Professor Zoom's been fucking with his life for a long right. ass time and then he goes out like a hero in Crisis on Infinite Earths. And I kind of feel like that's, that's enough. A, well, but that's he's, a defining moment. But he's done. He's been through enough yeah. shit. They like, should never have brought him back in the first place. Like, I agree. Ken, Barry, I as agree. a character, hey. was far more significant in his legacy and what he le- and the people that he left behind than he ever was as a character. Can, can we just say, I need to say something. They didn't bring back Barry Allen. No, like I've like said this before, Jeff too. Johns, Barry Allen. Yeah, we have. It's like one fucking the famous charred line is that we were talking about the new Fifty Two Flash, which it's was not famous. Which like is only good. you and I know. Well, this. Okay, it's famous to me. So I, you know, whatever. Iconic, um, uh, iconic, the iconic charred. We're line. talking about Barry Allen. We're talking about Barry Allen. And he goes. It's not Barry Allen. His name could have been Barry. Uh, his name could have been Wally West or Fred Armisen. And we were I was like, trying to come up with a fake name. And and we were like, we didn't know that Fred Armisen was the Flash. But um, so now every time I watch Portlandia, of course, I'm like, look, it's the Flash. Uh, <clears throat> the point being, like, this is Barry, Barry Allen. Allen. Barry Allen is a Silver Age character. He didn't have modern age stories, and so. He well, had, he was a milk toast. Like, yeah. he was a he was good in the time he existed in, but he was not an interesting character well, by like, any stretch of the imagination. He didn't have any of like Wally. The 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 big switch between Barry and Wally is Wally had a lot of pathos that Barry didn't have, and that's largely because. Barry came from the Silver Age, where right. superheroes didn't have a lot of fucking pathos. Yeah, they were all like, "What's up, chum? Hey, yeah, buddy, buddy, how are you pal? doing?" Yeah, it feels like. Jeff Johns brought Barry Allen back from the dead specifically so that he could deliver lines like when he's running and Superman is following him and he's like, you know, I'm just as fast as you. Like we've competed several times and Barry goes, Clark, though, that was for charity. And then he takes off and yeah, no, super it's, it's, fast. Like he specifically brought him back, not because it creates room for new stories or that he can like have these interesting character moments that only Barry Allen can have. It's specifically because he loved this character and, and he wants to have him have those like moments where he can show up other people. Well, and what's right. so strange about that is that like it's weird to like bring Barry back to do things that were like basically not a problem for Wally at all. Right. Yeah. Like well, and like by the time Wally is on the Justice League, like like some of the stuff I think about is Ennis's run on, uh, or excuse me, Morrison's run on JLA, right? Right. Like at one point, there's these great exchanges, and this may have been from Morrison to Joe Kelly or whatever. But like, you know, uh, Kyle is now the Green Lantern, and at that point, he's the only Green Lantern, and he's on the league. And you know, basically, Wally's one of his best friends, and Wally's just kind of like, yeah, you know, Batman's like that. Don't worry about it. Superman's cool, you know. But like. And, and Kyle's just kind of like, there's an exchange where Kyle is like, you know, how do you, like, how do you do this? Like, how do you become, like, so comfortable? He's like, well, you got to keep in mind two things, right? I'm never comfortable. I live in the shadow of a man who made the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. Who will always be more than I ever can be. He's like, and the other thing is, is I own what I can do. He's like, there is no one as fast as me. He's like, that's just the way it is. Doesn't mean I'm the best. Doesn't mean I'm the strongest or the, you know, whatever, but I am the fastest. And like, Hey, that's pretty awesome, right? And so, to have someone who's so clearly like Wally basically did everything with the Speed Force that even Barry could barely dream of, mm-hmm. and then to go back and be like, now Barry's back, and of course at the time, then they, they, yeah, not only did Barry show up, but then they basically screwed Wally West, and it's been that way ever since. Yeah, which you know, now one well, of us what, can become what a comic did writer. Happen and, to Wally West? Well, so during I mean, he's been he's been written out of the New Fifty Two, but yeah. leading up to it, like at one point he disappeared into the Speed Force because of some event. I can't remember what exactly. Well, it was there. Infinite Crisis. He disappeared. All oh, the right. speedsters did, and then Bart Allen 
became the Flash. Right. And like the thing is, is, I didn't appreciate it then, but now well, right. I do appreciate it because one of the most beautiful things about the Flash is his legacy. Unlike, uh, I, and I mean, it's great with Kyle too. But the the most amazing thing to me about reading Wally's Flash run is that. It's so important to him, like Barry's influence and the fact that he has to fill those shoes. Like it prevents, it holds him back for the first like fucking five years of that run. He can only run it like, I say only run, but like he's running at Mach 1 in the Flash, like volume three, number one. You know, like he can run across, I think he runs across the United States in uh, like two and a half hours, three hours or something like that. And it's like, eventually it gets to the point where they realize that he is so like the thought of him taking over as the flash and being what Barry was is so something he cannot deal with. So like on such a level that it prevents him from tapping into what he can really do. And so watching him become a hero is so much more than just watching him, you know, move past the 20 something douchebag kind of like, flirting with girls and blah 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 because like crazy shit happens to Wally in those early episodes but like or issues but the best thing is you watch him become not just a hero but somebody his predecessor can be proud of and somebody he's okay to be Mm. Wally can look at himself and go it is okay that I'm the flesh and I am just as good as Barry was and Barry would be proud of me that's a very important thing to him it's what makes legacy so important in comic comic book superheroes for me is like watching a character transition like that it would have been nice to do with bart and it's interesting for me to say like you felt the need to bring back a character from your childhood because you wanted you wanted to write that character like i think editorial should have said no yeah, like, make somebody that's else. But and you know, and even then, it's like even if they didn't say no, what just poggles my mind continuously is Jeff Johns brought back Hal Jordan and still paid respect to the rest of the the Green Lantern mythos so to he, a certain extent. My two theories about that are one: what I was going to say earlier is like Barry Allen sucks in a lot of ways because like he was never defined by the modern age of comics, but Hal was in yeah. post. In Christ's on Infinite Earth's world for about four years. Hal was being whiny well into the modern age. Yeah, yeah longer than that. Closer to seven. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, Emerald Night and all that stuff happened in the mid 90s. That was 96. Yeah. 97. Oh, okay, so like 10 so by years. The time, yeah, by the time he flames out his parallax, I mean, it's been almost a decade. Right. So, like, that's a significant amount of time to spend in the modern age to have not developed any character, yeah. which he develops all of the character that he has as Hal Jordan. In those years, almost. I wouldn't say all of it, but a significant portion of like what makes him Hal Jordan, I think, is defined by modern age comics. And even after he dies, he's around as the specter. Correct. Like and Hal Jordan never really leaves. When they put him back in the league, or in the, the Green Lantern costume, the other thing about that that makes it more significant than the Flash for me is they were not rebuilding a Flash core. They were not paying homage to any of the other Flashes. Right. It was Bart didn't suddenly come back. Jay Garrick wasn't suddenly there. It wasn't like a family of speedsters. It was like, everyone else sucks. Barry Allen's the man. With Hal, it wasn't like that. It was about rebuilding the core. It was about bringing the Guardians back, putting everyone, like, elevating them back to the level that they used to be at. Guy Gardner gets a character change in that book, too. He goes from being, like, the ultimate warrior or whatever he was for a while uh, to being a Green Lantern again. He goes from, we have no fucking idea what to do with Guy Gardner, too. He was the warrior, I think. Right, yeah. Yeah. Guy Gardner, the warrior. Very few people have known uh, what to do with Guy Gardner. One of the reasons I love... uh, Giffen and DiMatteis's run on JLI. Yeah, I was going to say, they know how, what to do. They knew exactly what to do with Guy Gardner, and a lot of people don't. And I really feel but like... I think that Johns think does, does, too. No, because, I like, think he... Yeah. Tomasi knows how. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, oh, the Green know. Lantern Corps, that book was great, underrated, too. But, like, it was about elevating the other characters at the oh. same time as bringing Hal back, because right. Hal restarted the, the, sh- the Lantern Corps. The shit that I don't understand about that, because I agree with you, mm-hmm. but I know... I fucking know that Jeff Johns gets it because one of the best parts of Blackest Night is when Jesse Quick is running from her father who's come back as a Black Lantern. Mm -hmm. And she talks about running with him and how it felt to be able to, like, break through and enter into this, into, like, 
when she said her dad's formula and what it felt like to be that free and that fast. And it's like, you fucking, you clearly understand this. You clearly get this connection. And this is the thing is like, I don't deny that Jeff Johns is a good writer. I like a lot of Jeff Johns stuff. There's some stuff that falls flat for me. I thought his run on Green Lantern, like the Green Lantern book, like up and through Sinestro Corps is like really, really solid run on that book. My problem is that his flash hard on is like it's overwhelming, overwhelming yeah. and I was really not interested watching another book of him rubbing out a flash hard on. Yeah. And that's what this book felt that's like. That's exactly what it is, yeah. And I'd I'd actually like to bring it back to the beginning because I haven't really gotten you to delve it. into my feelings on this book. Well, we're saving it for the end because you're gonna get angry. Uh, I'm gonna do my best not to get angry because I know that there are people who like this book. People in this room. Um and I don't want to shit all over something that other people like, even if I have problems. Just shit with. over it. Just I don't, don't care. <laughs> no one cares at this point. All right, so, still listening. So I read the five issues of Flashpoint, mm-hmm. and it, I fucking hated it. Like it just felt like an utter waste of my time. And then I stopped myself and I said, "This is exactly what happened with Infinite Crisis." And the thing that Chard said that I felt was very fair then was, "You didn't read the whole event." Yeah, and I don't you know read that the that's, core of it. I don't know that's true on this one. <laughs> well, I went back and I actually took the time, and I didn't finish every single issue of this because there's like there's eleven times as much side story as there is main story. Correct. But I tried to read. I got through about two thirds of the side books, mm-hmm. reading all of them and going like, you know, what's going on in this world? What have happened to the characters? Like, is there things that are told talked about in side books that like explain what's going on in the world? And there's not. No. Like, none of the character beats really work. The setting isn't really developed Why? in any meaningful Why way. Why don't the character beats work? How is the world not developed? Because I can tell you what's going on in that world. Yeah, I can tell you exactly what's going on in the world, but none of it really mattered to the story that was being told. Because you're, well, you're, like, you're getting a very small section mm-hmm. of what's going on with these characters in a universe that you know that is temporary that has nothing to do with the story of Flashpoint that's going on with Barry trying to figure out like why the world has been changed. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I ultimately came down to is that this book is operating in the shadow of other crossovers. And there are three that stood out to me, one of which more so than the other two. The two lesser ones, in my opinion, are Watchmen, to an extent, Mm -hmm. because I feel like this is reveling in the darkness Mm -hmm. that was prevalent in Watchmen. I think that it's referencing in some ways um, Kingdom Come. Like, it's trying to evoke some of the same kind of emotions of, like, this is the end of times, and you have these epic forces that are clashing, and the world is going to be consumed. But most of all, this book felt to me like it was trying to play the same game as Age of Apocalypse and it doing a shitty, piss-poor job of it. Uh, you know, Because I, the significant thing in a Age of Apocalypse is that there was a specific event that happened that set things in motion that changed the world where you can go, because this happened, this and this and this is different. And when you actually go through the event, because there are a lot of books in that event, it was like, eight or ten different series for four issues oh, it's plus well a bunch a of like extra pages. stuff uh no because i own the omnibus every single series ties back into the main story in some way mm-hmm. everybody has a mission everybody's trying to do something everything feedback feeds back so that when you get to the end it all matters and nothing that happened in any of these side stories matters to what's going on in flashpoint number one through five None of the characters are significant in any way. None, and there's no justification given to why this world is different. Yeah, Barry went back in time, and now the world is different. There is for a no reason. That's not true. I, What's yeah. the, re- the justification? There's no Flash. Right. I mean, like, I get, I get what you're saying. Uh, like, it I mean, feels I'm sorry, different. but it's like, 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 there's no reason. The, there's no fucking yeah. Flash because there's no Flash. Basically, the enti- there, there are. It's the whole butterfly flutters his wings thing. Like, the whole entire basis of this is if the fastest man alive doesn't make a shockwave in the Speed Force, then a, a, a spaceship lands in the wrong place. The wrong person gets shot. Look at how, look at how one def- offense. And, th- and this is the metatextual point of Flashpoint. I'm not saying it's well executed. It's saying, isn't it interesting how one little thing can make all the difference? And 
that one bullet goes one plate one one inch too far to the left and now the joker is is martha wayne and batman is thomas wayne because they basically break because they're one and only son of gotham has been laying down in the streets superman doesn't land in kansas where everybody is you know wherever it's i mean like the right, okay okay but but that like how does the fact that the flash never existed means that joe kill joe chill shoots bruce wayne instead of thomas and martha because the speed force well, no. I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, does yeah. it really matter? Because no, well, this is the this is the so two things about this. One, this is the defining factor of Elseworlds. Is like it's different. Oh, how is it different? Doesn't fucking matter. It just is. Because like, it fucking matters. No, it no, doesn't. It In does, Red no. Sun, it does not matter that he lands six hours later. What is important is what comes after, not what comes before. Like, you've significantly missed the point of Elseworlds if you're going, well, why is this well, world but, different? It's like, that's because it's different because that's how the writer chose to wrote it. This isn't an Elseworlds. It is. It's not. It is. It's not. It is 100% an Elseworlds. It's not because Barry is there. So. Barry travels to another universe, which happens right. in other Elseworlds okay, books. Yeah. Or so, I mean, I guess... Uh, <sighs> And other Elseworlds crossovers <laughs> in the multiverse. Like, this is a multiverse story about an alternate future multiverse world. Like, that's it. It just is, is an Elseworlds story. Whether you choose to accept that it is or not, it is an Elseworlds story. And also, number two, defining it as an Elseworlds story or not an Elseworlds story is irrelevant because it's all fiction and it's all fake and none of it matters. <laughs> and so this is what happens when you talk about books and you go, none of it mattered. I'm like, you're right, Toby. None of this matters. We do a show about fake books, about fake characters, about fake everything. It doesn't matter if it's called sci-fi. It doesn't matter if it's called fantasy. They're both fucking fake. And so defining it as such like adds nothing to the context of the story. It's an Elseworlds story and you can choose to go I'm going to read it or you can choose to go Nar. and the second part of this is that I'm going to lose it because the second part of this is it's important that the Flash is not there and that the Speed Force affected everything because it's important to Barry as a character. He goes, what the fuck did Professor Zoom do to my life? He's been running around in the Speed Force all crazy, fucking all this shit up, and I gotta stop him because he does this all the time. And you get to the end, and Professor Zoom's just sitting there laughing at him going, you did this! This is fucking your fault! And that's a good moment. Was it achieved as well as it could have been? No. I think it could definitely have worked better. I don't want to be an apologist for every event book out there because they're just not good enough, but it doesn't mean that they just get to get shit on because the writer wasn't up to par. It's like this stuff still happened, and it's still relevant, and you can either choose to go... I think that that's an important story moment because it says something about all of the characters in the book, or you can go, it's irrelevant because it what, doesn't say enough. What's astounding to me is that I can agree with you and disagree with you so much at the exact same time. <laughs> so, so <laughs> this is so th what you're saying right, right there. Yes, is why I think that the movie does a such better job. And because, I haven't watched. I want to watch because, it because because the 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 whole premise of the beginning right is that the JLA shows up to support Barry because he's an integral member of that family. Right, and his presence in their lives basically makes it better. This is as much so. The whole thing is is like, why is it that these people are this way? Because Barry never touched their lives. Mm -hmm. Why is Diana that much more aggressive and whatever? Because they never had the Flash in their lives. Why is Aquaman like? Yes, well, you can take umbrage with the specifics of how they got there, and I understand. I, I want to say something to defend Tobiah here. <laughs> I, can I interrupt you for one second? Sure. I have one other thing to actually support your point. Jay Garrick isn't there either, right? And they right. explicitly mention that, right? But c continue with what you're saying. So. I know that what you're saying, Chart, is true. Like, <laughs> it's all fake. Why the fuck do you care? But the the way that you create the artifice and the framework around things sometimes sets your expectations. And Tobiah made a comment during our Watchmen thing, which is which was you know es essentially that sometimes the best work in fiction is about getting people to accept your premise. Right. Right. And so sometimes if a premise is shoddily presented, it feels flat or whatever. You're well, kind of like, well, why? Like, I don't get it. We it talked just about this on Lazarus. Where it's like, Star Wars oh, has a right. very flimsy premise, and it's hard to believe until there are space wizards in it, and then you're okay with it? Like, right. that to me is like <laughs> but, the but, most unintelligible sentence well, but, I've but ever heard in my it, life. You're taking it literally, and I think that what Tobias is sometimes trying to grasp is about the, the, the total package, right? It's not, it's not, well, space wizards suddenly make this legitimate, quote no, unquote, from a logical point. It's yeah. like, oh, well, like, clearly this is meant to be an emotional story about legacy and, right. and power and connectedness. I, and, and, that, and I 
I get it. So it's it. like it's the, the issue for me is about internal consistency. It's mm-hmm. like if you say A is A, you can't then later say A is B and expect me to believe. How that. is Flash not internal? Flashpoint not internally consistent. Um. Well, I, I'll 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 get back to that in a second because there's something that Chard want, mm-hmm. was saying that I want to address in terms of what what matters. Right. If you're telling a story about like people fighting in a life or death struggle to save the world right. and in the middle of that story you turn the camera and there's a guy who's sitting in a restaurant and the waitress got his order wrong and he's trying to get the right food mm-hmm. and this scene goes on and on and on mm-hmm. and you get to the end of the movie and the guy who's trying to get his order it never tied back into anything else where this happened. Why does that matter? Right. It's like, you're okay, yeah, you're telling a story. This person is undergoing a struggle. Like, there right. are events happening, and at the end of it, he's a different person because he either got his correct food or he didn't. This is and a flimsy I, analogy. I know, I got And what that. I'm saying is that all of these side stories in the Flashpoint universe in no way tie back to what's going on. They don't... They're, they don't matter because well, you, they don't affect the you went right. well, them to find the rest of the story and right. the rest of the story is not there there is no right. more because so they're the, they're the, when I talk about there are nuggets of information there and if you want to know more I wish there was a place to do it this is that place but it's you not, can you can learn more about the different teams about what uh, who some of the people are but it doesn't have anything to do with the story it has more to do with the world yeah right. but and i mean i guess a lot of event books sup- have that premise they're right like a lot of those books they're providing kind of granular texture right but they're not necessarily giving you any more about the story like civil war i mean does it you know reading half the books that are attached to that series doesn't make that story any better or worse it just well it makes the story better or worse for some people because it provides that greater level of texture it doesn't address why the guys it- in the in the, getting his order in the restaurant, but it tells you nice things about the restaurant that maybe make you care more about it. Right, and if you had told me an Elseworld story that was specifically framed as this is an Elseworld story where Thomas Wayne and Martha Wayne are Batman and the Joker, mm-hmm. I'd be like, okay, that's an interesting story. Mm-hmm. Like, let's just run with that premise. That's cool. Right, but see, but if you're when going you to find it, this trade, it is an Elseworld story. Right, right. But what I'm saying is that when you frame this as here is the world of Flashpoint, where the Flash never existed, and therefore all of these things. And I go, wait, how do I get from the Flash doesn't exist to Martha Wayne is the Joker, and what does it have to do with Professor Zoom and Barry? Like, they, they yeah, feel it like two have completely anything to separate things like, that are being put together in a package to me, and I feel like I'm looking at the dude in the restaurant. Like, But, see, this is the difference I don't for understand. me. Is like, I'm, you look at me and you ask me that, and you say, like, well, what does this have to do with Barry and Professor Zoom? And I say, nothing. And you say, I'm unsatisfied about that answer. And I'm like, well, that's tough shit. Like, that's the well, only answer you're going to get. I don't even know that that's... Like, does it ruin the book for you? That's up to you. Because, like, the story about Martha and Thomas is the <clears> same <throat> whether you know that it's tied into the Flash or not. It's the same story. Well, but, well, but the but context here's the, here's the has, has colored is, that story for I'm you. I'm in the comic book store, and I buy Flashpoint, and then DC goes, hey, are you reading Flashpoint? This series ties into Flashpoint, mm-hmm. and it's very important to the story that you read it and buy well, it for $4 an issue. I don't know that they ever said that, because this is an interesting series, because it was billed as you could read any of them. Right, it was World of Flashpoint. Yeah, right? it was like it was meant for you to only pick and choose certain They didn't ones. do the thing that Marvel does, right, where they had like a 17-page checklist that's like, you need to read them in the Yeah, they didn't order. do right. that. They did was, not. Which I is very much why I more. was reading only the side stories, because I, I was picking up what and, seemed and cool. And maybe that was a bad decision on my part to read anything outside of those five issues. Mm-hmm. But even just reading those five issues, I look at this world and I go... This doesn't feel connected to me. See, I don't well, get this. I, I think one of the reasons I like this so much is because it reminds me of the Injustice world. And granted, this was first, mm-hmm. but I genuinely like the Injustice stuff. I, I didn't until I played the video game story all the way through. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, wow, this this is incredible. Mm-hmm. And when I read Flashpoint, I, I'm feeling like that again. I'm like, there's this whole new world with all these different changes because of one thing. Yeah, and I, I mean, like in Injustice, spoilers for the first ten minutes of the game, Superman kills somebody, and it creates an alternate timeline in which Superman becomes the bad guy. Right, and I think that that's 
the inherent beauty of Elseworld stories is like you can take a singular event or a single thing or like kind of like what Marvel What If used to do is like, what if Bruce Banner didn't get Hulk powers, but that little kid did or whatever. Like, and you can run with that story, right? So, and that's like, that's what right. and Elseworlds that, are about. And that's why Age of Apocalypse worked so well because it's like, okay, Charles Xavier is dead. Magneto is leading the X-Men. Apocalypse is suddenly springing into action 20 years earlier. Mm-hmm. And all of this shit happens because of those two specific events. Right. Well, here's something and for you. I don't necessarily know that that's... I, okay, I I see where you're going with this. I don't necessarily know that it's a fair comparison. Not that I'm defending Flashpoint, but age AOE or AOA was, was very definitely an event that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And not all the books, I mean, while I agree with you about their overall consistency, they're definitely weaker parts and stronger parts. This, I think, the, the, the reason this, I think if you had had that kind of concerted effort, yes, you could have had this moment, like, you could have had your Flash title leading up to this, where this one moment happens. But, like, I think really at the end was that the, the, the reason this book falls down for me is because it's not... I don't feel like it's a story. It's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there are a lot of, it's, it's like rather than, you know, building, I I feel like building a story, building a world, right. Is you have to, there's questions that you ask yourself that you're going to answer. There's a certain thing. Like we're not going to get, clearly we're not going to get a view of the whole world because we can't, we can't do that. It's like, we're not building a whole world, right? We're just building this glimpse of the world where Barry has fucked over time, Aston Kutcher style, and like... Hey, I like the butterfly effect. <laughs> I, can't, I cannot stand that movie, but only because I I think I just watched it when I was at a certain point. But r- regardless of, of the good Mr. Kutcher, I think... Kutcher? The, Kutcher? What, I, I don't know. Miss... Miss... Uh, Mr. Kutcher. Mr. Mila Kunis. You mean to me more? Mila Kunis. Mr. Go Fuck Yourself over there. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, it's it's just... I, I, I think what gets me here is that this is not bad storytelling as much as it is sloppy storytelling. And that and that's ultimately the thing for me. Like, I don't have a problem with the idea of the story that they told or necessarily the stories that existed within this conceptual universe. It's that as an event, I feel this was poorly executed. I, like they, I can see the ideas that he's playing with, and reading it, I'm like, "Wow, you did a really shitty job of conveying that." Like, why? Why are you doing all these things? And I, feel- no, and I think Grant has a strong point there, which is like, the concept is there. It the ideas doesn't are there. Feel finished until well, you watch the film. And I think that, and I, well, and I feel like that's that that kind of refutes. I was checking something to see exactly what Thawne says in his speech here. And again, it's like, did they fix it after the fact or did they know something or did this get cut short? This isn't, a, I think that the fact that there are nuggets that can be cohesively pulled together to make a really interesting film to me shows that it was a, that it was a story that had its basic intention and framework, that it wasn't solely a means to an end. I feel like when I read it, I see that the means to the end were clearly bolted onto it like Frankenstein's monster after the fact. Like, I feel like there was a rough sketch of Flashpoint solely as a Barry Allen vehicle at its core with some interesting tidbits scattered throughout in the way that an event book is, and then it got basically bastardized to be the vehicle for the new 52 concept after the fact. I agree with that entirely, and I think that if you had scaled this back and gone, okay, we're going to do six a six-part series or an eight-part series or whatever where Barry is in alternate dimension land and we're going to explore this alternate dimension that Barry created. And at the end, he puts it back and it's not connected to anything else, but it's just a story by itself. Yeah. I think it would have worked a lot. Well, better. the one thing that they did that was really a masterstroke, in my opinion, in the film is Barry gets back and he's in his new suit, the new 52 suit, and Batman's in his new 52 armor, and they have their exchange, and they don't say anything about well, it. Well, it's the same thing in the comic. Well, no. Yeah, on the is. last page. No, no, no. no. Pandora shows up and says, oh, okay. I'm doing this, and there's three timelines, and there's all this bullshit. Okay, they don't yes. do that in the movie. Yeah. Literally, it's Barry runs back in time, catches himself, then he's back in the Batcave, and they look different. And Batman's like, everything's okay? And Barry's like, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. And like I think they that's didn't, perfect. I think it's well, cool too because, like, the more the characters know that like something's wrong, because like 
Barry's told in the book in Flashpoint, Barry's told that the universe is different than how it used to be. Like he remembers the original universe too. Right. And that's so That never ever ever comes up again in the New 52. My impression reading that last issue is that he only remembers the New 52 universe and his life with his mother from the Flashpoint, Flashpoint. universe. Yeah, well, I mean, he doesn't the remember that, the pre-52 But even universe. that weirdly like remembering right. stuff that his mom doesn't come up. So I want to, there's two things I want to get, say real quick. Joe and I had a conversation about six months before New 52 came out that I still to this day say that the New 52 could have been one of the most ambitious and brilliant con- like things ever done. I was so excited. Had they done exactly what they said they were doing. Yeah. If they wouldn't have shoehorned Flashpoint in the way that they did, if they would have done like what the Flashpoint Paradox did as far as its execution and then basically rebooted stuff and had done a thorough job of editorially selecting what things were in canon and not and then let some of the people do the things that they said they were going to do, I think it could have been an incredibly ambitious reboot, especially when you consider that they are still playing around with this idea, for instance, like Booster Gold is the only person who can move throughout the multiverse and, like, knows what's going on and, like, all this shit. Like, it would have been... There's so many beautiful things that could have been done in the land of what if. Oh, God, yes. But it should have would. But here's my thing. Here's my thing about Flashpoint. I feel like we are, again coming to part of this division that we have in our group, which is the difference between a story that you're expected to read versus the story that you get and whether or not that shapes how much you're willing to tolerate about something. Mm-hmm. I walked into Flashpoint expecting a, 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 a Flash-centric story that had certain concepts tied behind it. And so I don't have a hard time buying the explanation that's given. So Thawn says... Or, I keep wanting to call him Thawne. But yeah, it is Thawne. Yeah, Thawne. Sorry. Eobard Thawne. Eobard Thawne. So Thawne says name. in Flashpoint 5 that the reason this world is so fucked up isn't just because Barry changed something. It's because he changed it in the worst possible way by being negligent. And Thawne uses the analogy of you shattered time like a windshield. You passed through it like a bullet. So it wasn't just like there was one event that kind of fiddled with things in the way that we could talk about Age of Apocalypse. It's that Barry basically drove himself to a point of such great despair and did something that was so counter to what he normally wants to do as far as being kind of everywhere and being a goody Mm two-shoes that he fundamentally fractured the world. And that's why this world is so broken. And, And that's why you're being asked to see it because Barry's journey is to basically witness firsthand because he doesn't he can't find Thawne and he doesn't exactly know what's going on at first all of the ways in which his actions are broken and he doesn't know it right the whole thing is that in 5 he discovers that it was actually because if he's walking around being like I can't believe Professor Zoom did this thing. Right, right right no no I did this to myself I did this to the world I created ripples. I create. I was the butterfly. And I think that should have been an amazing moment. Yes. Well, and that's the thing. You say that, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds really cool. I really wish I would have seen that. No. Well, I, but I mean, because, the thing is, is that you know, it's like it. if you want to fucking tell me everything, write me a fucking book. Well, if you want to use a comic book, then fucking show me because you could have shown that in a fucking two and a half page prologue. Like that's and that's well, the no, whole thing. Well, but the whole like, thing is that they don't want to show that. They don't want to show want you. To but have you it. don't have to attribute any. That's the thing. Is that like. You don't. You can show your audience as much or as little as as you want. Like you could have shown us something that looked totally innocuous, and then gone one year later. Barry wakes up at a desk. Somebody's saying the name of a supervillain as he doesn't understand. He doesn't recognize. They, he tries to run. He can't. His mom's. There. Well, they try to. I see. This is the thing where I think Andy Kubert is not a, the best choice. They try to do that, right? Like you see, Barry like has this thing about his mom and like she died. But and this is again, I can't believe I keep saying this because it feels kind of silly. But this is what I think the Flashpoint paradox. So I am supporting you to a certain extent. Is that they make that 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 liminal moment about his mom dying? It's much right. more clear that it was affecting to him. And they just build it in a much better way. And, and I think it's fair that, like, the film has done some of these things better. Like, I haven't seen the film. I'll definitely go and watch it on your recommendation. But, like, at a certain point, I'm not an archaeologist. I don't want to have to dig through his story. Like, if you give me something to fucking work on, then goddamn yes, I will go as deep as I feel need. Like, we talked about this during the wake, about how I didn't just want to walk away from that. Mm-hmm. Like, I wanted to fucking dig into that. I wanted to know. And, like, that's the thing. If you give me a rope to fucking hold on to, I will fucking hold on to that goddamn rope. If you're going to gnaw on a bone, you need the expectation that you're going to get some sweet marrow at the end of that. Yeah, I need a decent bone, right? Like, I need need to feel like the rope I'm holding on to is substantial. And I think he tries. He tries in this. But, like, 
I just, I feel like it's all thrown together. I don't, like, there are things that I want to see, not not just because, like, it would be cool to see them, but because I feel like not seeing them causes the story to suffer. Mm. And here's my problem with that, exp- with, like, oh, you, you did it, Barry. Like, you shattered time. You time traveled like an amateur. That... To me, sounds like Superboy punching that? time. <laughs> yeah, except, except, ex- but, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. This is the mat. We are now okay, on it. Okay. I am ready to wrestle you. <laughs> the problem with that perception is that there is nothing fundamental to the Batman universe where Superboy fucks with time. There is everything essential to the understanding of the Flash mythos that the Speed Force and time itself is something that is fragile and that the people who operate within it are incredibly powerful because of the choices that they make. And that Professor Zoom not only has come back from the future to fuck with the guy that gave him his powers in the future, but also he created the guy that gave him his powers in the future. Right. You have to remember that in Rebirth, they rewrote that. So Zoom is the one that makes Barry Allen. And maybe it's my fault for not having read 30 years of Flash no, comics. No, 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 well, no, 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 it's, no, no, this is one of the few times I'm ever going to say this. Fuck you, Toby. You didn't have to read 30 years of Flash comics. You've read basic JLA books. You understand that the feed speed force holds time and space I, together. I actually don't. Like, really? There's a lot of nuance. <laughs> because half the comics I've made you read in the show basically say that. I mean, like, no, there's a lot of nuance in terms of what the speed force is and what it does that I have no fucking idea about because I've not read The Flash. Like, Which, And a lot of see, these events, they're like, oh, we're going to go into the Speed Force and a thing is going to happen. And, and there isn't a web where those things like all are woven together into a into a harmonious whole where I go, oh, yes, of course, obviously this makes sense. Well, then this would be like somebody showing up on book four of Harry Potter and being like, what the fuck is this school with wizards about? This doesn't make any goddamn sense. <laughs> Yeah. Like you can't come into some, like I mean like well, well, like like I, episode one hundred and one <laughs> flashpoint subtitle <laughs> fuck you Toby Perfect. no 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 so like no I get what I I, I understand that but I think well and I, I I'm kind of with Toby on this one I feel like you shouldn't have to over yeah, it absolutely. right and that, and that's the thing is if they had had like okay wait hold on a second if they had had one to two pages where they had just gone into a little bit about like hey the speed force and like the time stream are intimately related and it's like they almost got there. And then didn't quite. I mean, again, they could have just shown it as executed visually. as well as yeah. it should have been. Right? They could have visually showed it better. So one of the things they do in same writer. One of the things that Jeff Johns does in Blackest Night is mm-hmm. kind of lay out the whole seven colors, yes. black, right, and visually presents that in the beginning. So I can I can sympathize that. Well, that and the maybe one isn't thing that attack. Blackest Night does that this doesn't is give you a fucking like. At no point in Blackest Night am I going, where's that guy? Like, where'd that guy? Or, like, why are these two people fighting? Because he does a fairly good job of, like, laying it all well, out there. It's also eight issues. And no, that's, no, and that's exactly right? the point I was building to. Yeah. It's like, why five issues for this seems yeah, that is weird. Awesome. I was surprised. Really short. I was surprised short. when I actually did the count. Because I, I have it as, a, oh, excuse me, I have it as a giant pile of everything. And yeah. So I, like, kind of sifted through it all. I was like, what? One, two, three, four. What? I mean, oh, I yeah. really, and it's like, I'm not the biggest Johns fan, but there are things I would have liked to see. I think I really would have genuinely enjoyed seeing the the, the heightening of hostilities between Arthur and Diana. I think I yeah. really would have enjoyed yeah. seeing like those moments because well, okay. those are the kinds of things that I I I went into this reading. I was like, okay, I'm probably gonna I'm gonna do my best to give this yeah, like a fair the shake. Fucking Ocean and Master a, and like, and Aquaman killing Deathstroke was like awesome. It's like, and I just wanted like five to six more pages of that spread out throughout the series so so something that they do in the animation that brings me back to <laughs> one not talk about the animation. no 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 i have to i have to no 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 because i'm supporting your point i'm supporting your point all right but, now it's allowed but we talk okay. about it we talk about it we talk about we talked about it in relationship to Watchmen. the use of visual cues to help g- give texture to the world yeah, right. newspaper headlines news reports on television scene yeah. screens and so there's a lot of that stuff that's ambient noise right, that you pick right. up and this is again why i think that if, if it was in the book which i think some of it probably is andy kubert's weird frenetic style and maybe amplified by whoever the colorist is does not serve the story well like if the expectation is that you're supposed to kind of osmos a certain amount of the universe just from the stuff that's happening in the background it's really hard to do with this art yeah. as far as i'm concerned well and i mean it's not Kubert's art doesn't bother me too much. I think, I, I mean, I, I definitely understand 
what you're saying. You want, I, I, I think the star story would have benefited from a cleaner line, and maybe, uh, maybe the coloring could have been. I didn't think the coloring was over. It was was bad, but to me, it's not. It's not about the art. It's about like. How the scripting told the artist to portray things, right? That's well, exactly and, what I well, was going to get at. I my understand. I don't. I don't remember this for sure, but I could have sworn that Jeff Johns was one of the more looser scripters. Well, and maybe he shouldn't be. Well, <laughs> right? Like, and I think that that's the thing. Is like, there's a time for that. Or you know, you were saying this before about teams of people. Maybe right. part of the issue was that Andy Kubert was just like, "Who's a hot artist? We can get on Flashpoint." You, Andy, you're up, and he's like, "Okay," right. but he didn't have an investment. Which Although I think he did do some of the character design stuff, but even some of the character design seems strange. And yeah, like I'm, I'm willing to concede. Like I want to make it clear. Like I'm not saying that Flashpoint is great. I'm also not saying that the Flashpoint paradox is the greatest WB animated feature ever to be created. To be clear, because I know I've talked about it a lot. I just think that I feel like a lot of the evidence suggests to me that this is something that at its heart had some good ideas rather than it being a mishmash of random crap thrown together for no good reason. Fair. I'm saying that I feel like the execution of it indicates that at least at its heart, Jeff Johns had an idea, mm-hmm. a framework for it, a story he wanted to tell, and a reason for it. I just don't think it was executed well, which I think is different than what you guys were trying well, to drive at. I, to be honest, saying. I think that we were om- almost all of us are saying the exact same thing. Yeah, I feel like there's, there's just different things, things that bother us about it. Right, like, sure. At the core of the story, except for Kate Nugget. Likes it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. I, I'm, I, just I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I did say that this is not a good event book. It is a good Elseworlds book. Yeah. yeah sure. Mm. Um, like, I think that if Jeff Johns had plotted this book book and somebody else had scripted it it may have been a much stronger story maybe he just needed to write a second well, draft i don't like, even know that it, it needed well, a second I mean, it's just like, like it needs to be better you, you you get, oh i think john's is an idea man i think he's got some great ideas i think you let him do the big moments and you get somebody small you get somebody a little bit more feet planted on the ground well, he needs an irvin irving uh, kirchner you know he needs somebody that's going to come in and take that vision and put it in a place why well, well, oh my god Lawrence this, the, yes he needs this george lucas's right. assistant from empire strikes back right well, I mean, arguably, that's what we're seeing with some of the WB animation stuff in general, right? Right, Is yeah. plotting by original people who did the book. Mm, yeah. It's their plot, but scripted by other people yeah. to fit that format and all yeah. that stuff. But I think sometimes those stories are more successful because somebody else was like, why would this character have this conversation? Like, no, let's take that you out. Know let's what? move this around. Let's switch this up. Another good example of this is on the, on the podcast, I have recommended the Supergirl quite, quite a few times. Yeah. And they've actually done a... WB animated movie uh, of yeah, that. Superman Apocalypse, right? Is yeah, Superman called? Batman yeah. Apocalypse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, which Joe and Tobiah introduced me to, and it was quite a bit different because they had redone some of the stuff in the book that didn't make sense. Some of the fights in that animation oh, oh, so good. So I don't good. know that I can tell the story of me watching it if I have not on the show. You have actually on the show. Have I? Have I don't it? think I've t- okay, ever told it no. on the show. You're right. I, don't I don't think, think I can. Have. All right, I'm gonna. That's that's for private ears only. <laughs> anyway, I watched that movie and it was crazy because I watched it with people that do not normally watch comic book movies, and the reactions to the fight scenes in that was a pretty. Classic. We, will, we will find a way to get that information out to the masses. Yeah, somewhere. I don't. Yeah, it's pretty inappropriate. There were drugs involved. There were drugs involved, and it was fairly inappropriate language. So um, even for this show, whoa. Uh, but anyway, um. I think the cla- another classic example of that is uh, the Marvel movies, where sure. you have stuff like Civil War, which draws enough of the source material, but distances itself enough from what made Civil... Uh, not Civil War. I'm thinking Winter, Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier. What made Winter Soldier... like? There's a specific term for this, and I think I've mentioned it on the show before. Adaptation distillation. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like that should be like a, something that's looped in the back of like a... Uh, yeah. techno song adaptation does that mean that the that's how you make whiskey where they right do it, it, the yeah. story the studio where they storyboard the marvel movies is an adaptation adaptation distillation installation no it's an adaptation <laughs> distillery oh. thank you jared yeah. jeez i don't know terminology should right. we move on to recommendations i think so <laughs> Um, have we have we violently assaulted each other with our words enough? Yeah. I it? recommend the entire first three years of the D fifty two. Kate has lost his shit. Uh, I think he's just coughing. I think he's dying. <laughs> no, I was uh, laughing at the installation distillation installation. <laughs> eh. 
I like wine better. Adaptation, distillation. Joe. Distillation. Yeah, what do you want? Recommendations, go. Uh, I'm going to recommend something that I think I recommended way back in the day. So I think it's a redemption pick. Uh, it's um, Liberty Meadows by Frank Cho. And I want to mm. read the first three. I don't think you've recommended this. Have I not? I don't I'm, think so. I definitely have wanted to. And I'm going to recommend the four volumes that are out because they're comic strips and they're incredibly fast reading. Yeah. Uh, I think you pitched this on the imaginary show that you have in your head when we're not around. That's a, that's a far better show than this one. <laughs> this is Ingleby. Would you I, like I some did. GY? Thank you, Mr. I, Betty. I would. I, oh, God, that is such a great show. I wish that I, wish, I could figure out I a way to get that. that out of my head because it would be the best show in the universe. It's amazing. Uh, okay, so yeah, Liberty Meadow. Was Liberty one Meadow by Frank Cho, volumes one through four. It's a very fast read. Uh, and it's basically um, this vet goes to this place called Liberty Meadows, which is an animal sanctuary for special animals that have been, like, rescued from, like, the circus and random other places. And it's the adventures of this vet and these animals who all talk. And uh, one of them is a college mass... Uh, Dean, the pig, who's a college mascot, <clears throat> uh, who dresses like a bro and smokes and eats and is awful with the ladies. It's, and it's very reminiscent of Bloom County in my mind. It is very. It's got. It draws heavily from Bloom County. It draws heavily from. Um, oh, it totally went out of my head. Uh, it's uh, from like the old Yogi Bear cartoons. It's very like tongue in cheek and there's lots of cheesecake yeah there is there is well um, yeah i mean there is there is in in the form of brandy and then later in the form of brandy's roommate jen i believe her name is uh and uh there's leslie the frog who is an incredibly neurotic uh character and then i cannot i'm totally spacing on the name of the bear right now i don't think we need every name. but uh it's it's great it's a lot of fun to read um we haven't talked about uh like a comic strip in a while like a cartoonist book and frank cho i think is uh is a great cartoonist and i think he's got a really solid sense of humor um and about now is this the guy who worked for marvel for a while yes okay Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, who he worked with uh, Bendis on Avengers. Yeah, was Avengers. I can't remember if it was Avengers. I seem to Avengers. also be associating the name where Ultron uh, became a busty Shauna woman. the She Devil. I'm not surprised. I'm not yeah. surprised at all. That, uh, yes, yes, and he's also done. I mean, he's Frank Cho uh, is uh, no relation to Amadeus Cho. Yeah, no, no relation at all. Okay. He is uh, renowned for his depictions of the female form. We'll say that his pinups. Yeah, he's not, he's, he has yeah, pinup. Books. He's got like, pinup books. That's what he's known for. Uh, he is, uh, and I love his artwork. I really, really do. He has a super clean line. Yeah, incredibly clean. Uh, so, and I <laughs> thought it would be a lot of fun to talk about because I think it's a lot of fun to read, and uh, I think we'll have a cool conversation about cartooning and. Uh, that's something I'm really interested in. So yeah, Liberty Meadows, the first four volumes, All which right. are the only ones out because he got picked. Uh, like he started working on Avengers at that point, uh, and Image was putting out Liberty Meadows, and he just kind of. I think one issue came out after that is not collected, mm. but uh, I think I don't know if it's in limbo or what. But yeah. All right, well, Cade, what would you like to read this week? Okay, so my recommendation comes from podcast listener uh, Brandon Hill. Um, And he tried to get me to read a book called Creature Tech, and I did, and I loved it. Great book. So I'm going to pitch it. Um, He actually wrote me a pitch to get me interested in it, and so I was just going to read that because it's really good. Um, so basically, Creature Tech is Doug Tanapple's brain dump and is the place where Tanapple puts the characters that have been in his head for 10 years onto the page. It's about Dr. Ong working in the government facility Creature Tech that devotes itself to studying mystical and alien things to scientifically understand them. Things go wrong, though, when the newly revived Dr. Jameson tries to bring back a giant space eel with the Shroud of Turin to destroy the Earth. So Dr. Ong, with the help of an alien parasite that knows Kung Fu, has to stop him. And it also has a praying mantis man-government agent turned redneck. As you do. And yeah. that, that um, sounds like a great book right there to me. So. Interest peaked. I'll say that. Creator of Earthworm Jim, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, I did end up reading the whole thing in one city, and I, I absolutely loved it. Cool. Well, it's not super long or dense. No, it's, it's like it's 200 great. pages. Yeah. Sweet. All right, Brent, what did, uh, what did you bring this week? I brought the Warren Ellis graphic novella, Etheric Mechanics, which is basically alternate universes, alternate universe Sherlock Holmes investigates an invisible man. Warren Ellis style. Nice. Oh. So, so there's lots of always. profanity. And it's, uh, it's a novella. You, It is very small. It's a it's prestige really, yeah. size. Yeah, yeah, not very big. Uh, in, uh, penciled by Gianluca Pagliarani. Avatar Press. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of uh, interesting because it's got weird alt sci-fi stuff dropped right in the middle of, you know, Sherlock Holmes' England. His, Sherlock Holmes, in this case, being Sax Raker is his name mm. in this world, <clears throat> basically. That's a pretty awesome detective name, actually. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I picked this up completely on a whim one day. I was like, Warren Ellis wrote something. I'll grab it. I don't even know what it's about. And mm-hmm. I was, I, I put it down in a case. I read it about once a year. Where I'm just kind of like shaking my head, and I'm like, that Warren Ellis guy, where does he come up with this stuff? Where does he get his wonderful ideas? That's right. From his head. Yeah, kind of a, just it, a different flavor than what we normally read. He's got a second read. head. And he it's short enough you can read drugs. while Diablo 3 is booting up. I mean, you would have the best drugs, too, if Alan Moore called you. We don't need to go there the again. Time. I've had enough of Alan Moore. I'm obsessed with, with that story. Uh, so I also brought a book that was originally pitched it to me by a listener. Nice. And I'm not 100% certain who it was. I believe I remember who it was, but I don't want to say the wrong person's name on the air. So the person who pitched this to me, you know who you are, and thank you. Uh, I brought The Now of Brown by uh, Glenn Dillon. Mm. Uh, and this is a really interesting kind of slice of life book uh, about this girl named Now Brown. She's uh, half British and half Japanese. Uh, and she has OCD. I remember this now. Uh, not the like compulsively like flipping off light switches or cleaning kind of OCD. She obsessively like pictures incredibly gruesome things like she's standing uh, on a subway platform it's, un, it's called unwanted thought syndrome right it's, it's maria bamford has a similar thing and so she talks right. about that in some so like she, she's in the subway and she's like obsessively imagining pushing somebody off the platform in front of a train mm-hmm. or she's walking down the street and a pregnant woman walks the other way and she obsessively thinks about stabbing the woman in the in the stomach over and over and over again mm-hmm. Uh, and so, like, a lot of her life is about, like, coping and managing with these thoughts. And, like, this is not a dark book in any way. I was going to say some light reading. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... It's, it's, it's pretty... actually... It's fun and sweet. And, like, she meets this guy. And, like, they start going out. And it's about their relationship and the things that grow out of that. Uh, and just, like, her relating to life. Mm-hmm. And it's it's sweet and fun. And, like, she's a huge anime fan. And there's, like, a side story about this anime that she really likes that's, like, weird and funny. Uh, and it's a really great book. The art is freaking gorgeous. I absolutely love like the color palettes that that is used throughout this, and just like the line work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's outside of the stuff that I normally read and enjoy, but I really really dug this book. Hmm. So that's the now of Brown. Nice. Uh, well, I've already forgotten what week of image it is, uh, because we took a week off from recommendations and there's no way I could possibly remember something for two weeks. Uh, but before I pitch the image book, I do want to mention that humblebundle.com is doing their image (laughs) first humble bundle image comics two. is what it's called. Humble Image Comics Bundle two image first. That's what it's called. And, uh, you can find it at humblebundle.com. Uh, and it'll be like in the main humble bundles and it should be up for like another five days after this is released. Um, but I want to mention it because it is the most incredible deal of digital comics I've ever seen ever. Like hands down. This better is than the dark horse. Star better Wars than one. the dark horse. Star Wars. Yeah, one. Joe, you just got this. Yeah, I did. So it's beautiful. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read to you what you get. So you get Image Expo 2015 preview book. You get Alex and Ada Volume 1, which is five issues. Deadly Class Volume 1, six issues. Cowl Volume 1, five issues. Elephant Man 2260 Book 1, five issues. Minimum Wage Volume 1, six issues. God Hates Astronauts Volume 1, which is the web series. Genius 1 through 5. Satellite Sam Volume 1, which is five issues. You get that for paying a dollar. You get that for paying whatever you want. 
if you pay more than the average, which at the time of recording is $15.10, you also get The Manhattan Projects Book 1, which is 10 issues, The Wicked and the Vine Volume 1, which is 5 issues, Fuse Volume 1, which is 6 issues, Vel Velvet Volume 1, which is 5 issues, Criminal Volume 1, which is 6 issues, Which is Issue Number 1, Walking Dead 22, A New Beginning, which is 6 issues, The Fade Out, Issue Number 1, and if you pay more than $18, you also get Saga Book 1, which is 18 issues of Saga, which is the hardcover, the first three trades. East of West, The World, which I believe is just a single issue. And The Walking Dead Compendium Volume 1, which is 48, 48 issues. issues. It's, it's not as big as the Valiant Bundle. The Valiant Bundle was... I think dollar wise, I think this is more because it's two hundred and eighty three dollars worth of comics. Well, for no, the, the 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 valiant one was somewhere around five or six hundred bucks. Okay, I, but I mean, it's still fucking it, impressive. It's insane. I just tonight bought the Wicked and the Divine Volume One for ten bucks, right? Because it's a Volume One. Yeah. Joe paid twenty dollars for the bundle and I got it bucks like extra. how many? I bundles? got all of those. Yeah, it's like plus it's like on, twenty on bars. Wednesday. They will release more books. Yeah. And if you've already bought it, you get those. Yeah, and so right. I because I've already paid more than the minimum, I will unlock those too. Right. Like uh, normally, like I'm not the kind of guy that goes onto Steam and it's like, oh, these like we'll buy a game just because it's cheap. Like I have to legitimately yeah. want to buy. That's play me. Games. That's not you. Yeah, but like hum I've bought three humble bundles just because I've been like. I, I cannot. This is so cheap and well, there's so much. I cannot. And it supports the industry it. in such a cool way because you can choose how much of your money goes yeah, where. Absolutely. So you can say, like, how much goes to the humblebundle.com, how much goes to Image Comics, and how much goes to the, uh, the, the Hero Initiative. Well, and it's different for each one. This, this one, one is, is Hero, Hero Initiative. Initiative, which is an awesome cause. But Which last time I think I gave, like, all but $2 to yeah, the Hero Initiative. I, gave, I, was just like, I think I gave 10 to the Hero Initiative and then 5 and 5. It'd be, kind of, it'd be kind of funny if you could granularly break it down by creator. Like, Brian K. Vaughn will get 18%. <laughs> right? That would be, the too, team, there's like a hundred sliders. The team from will get 12%. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, like, I paid to buy two of these volumes, and for the price of two of those volumes, I got all of them. That's just It's funny, because, like, I, I turned to Mannix to tell him about this last week, and he was like, yeah, I own all that stuff, but I already bought it. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, I just bought it again. Because <laughs> it's just, I think this is so important for comics. And also, oh. in the news, I just got a pimp that uh, num that Image Comics got announced as the nine of the ten best-selling graphic novels of last year. So, how are these delivered? I've never uh, done so a So, they're DRM-free. Yeah. You can choose what format you want them in. You can get them as uh, CBZ, PDF, C PDF or C CBR. CBR. And they keep them on the Humble Bundle website. So, like, I log into the Humble Bundle website, and they're all right there. And I can yeah. choose to download them on any computer. Right. So. Uh, I have them all on a hard drive. So, like, yeah, technically, I could download I could just them and give them, them to, to you everyone, or whatever. But... Like, I mean, it really is the. For, especially for somebody who wants to read a lot of this shit and doesn't collect single issues because I don't have the room Correct. or the. That's me. The wherewithal. Like, I mean, I've got easily. 500 issues of comic books right now just from the humble bundles they're not even taking up room on my hard drive it's the best of all possible worlds. and what's crazy is i hate the comiXology app for reading like i'll do it because it's the only way to right do it. But i have another comics reader i prefer yeah me too i just, and I it just into this, yeah. so it's i've it's had better. absolutely no problem so this is this is yeah like we're pimping it pretty hard because it really is that great like well I it's they are cool. not even giving us any goddamn money which they should be because we love them oh it's, they don't even need to well, this that's is, how this hard my I love fifty two this. weeks of image so I have to like every well, time image is going succeeding to that's winning. even better yeah, than no, they're giving it to us right it's it's fucking amazing although. Yeah people will be able to give money to us in our Patreon, which right. will be launching hopefully within a couple of days of when this goes out. You probably heard a bumper at the beginning yeah, of this There episode. was a mini announcement last week. There'll be a little bumper on here, and we'll make a big announcement when it actually goes live. But yep. hopefully within a couple of days of this going out. Correct. Uh, however, because of the Humble Bundle, I was inspired to pitch one of the books that was in there, which I kind of forgot about, but read all the single issues of. So the first trade is not out yet. But this was uh, Genius, which was the Top Cow uh, pilot season winner from last year. Uh, the cool thing about Top Cow pilot season now is it used to be republished by Top Cow, and now it's published by Image, who owns Top Cow, but it's an Image book now, and it says Image right on the front, and so all the people that 
I know that there are a lot of people that go out and buy like image firsts and stuff. They're now more likely to pick up pilot season. So it's more prestigious than it used to be to win this. It's like a bigger deal. Genius is a book, and I believe it's set in L.A. I can't exactly remember, but it's um, it's a story that kind of like hypothesizes like what if the next great tactical mind, uh, like Alexander the Great or uh, Tilla the Hunt or something, was not born in like some military capacity, was born in like a uh, a, a poorer, rundown suburb. And so there's this, um, her name is Destiny. There's a woman who's born and she grows up in the slums in gang warfare. And she's a young African-American woman and she basically rises up through the ranks of this gang, takes over and is this kind of tactical genius and runs this coup against the city who's like kind of uh, oppressing them. And uh, it's set in the real world. And I think the unfortunate side effect of it being published was I guess it's not a side effect of it being published but the unfortunate thing about when it was published was it happened the first issue came out like three weeks before the protests in in Ferguson Mm. gained mass national attention so a lot of people were comparing this book to Ferguson in which it is no way similar so I think that that's the unfortunate side effect is a lot of this book got like hyped for a lot of the wrong reasons and people went to pick it up and were like, that's not what this is about and then put it down. I think it's a really interesting book and I think it's a cool like examination of some aspects of like these political environments, but it is not that kind of book. Right. Um, that being said, it came out like every other week. Like it came out for two months and five issues came out it came it came out really quickly so if that's how image is going to do their pilot season i think that that's a really cool deal i'm surprised that it hasn't come out in trade yet i have two theories either that they rushed the series to come out to launch because they wanted to get it away from the public like comparing it to current world events and also that's why they're probably holding off on the trade so maybe difficult to find is my side. But if you bought the Humble Bundle then Image you Comics it. too, you've got it. So yeah. And you can get it for – is it part of the core thing? Yeah. Yeah, you can so get it for a buck. Is it a minimum $1 or is it you can I, pay what you want and I, pay nothing and get the core thing? I don't know if you can you pay You can't pay nothing. You, you do have to pay something. Okay, right. so for you $1 do have to pay something. Yeah. you can get this. Yeah, I believe the dollar is minimum. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not part of the like pay more than the minimum. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure yeah, it was yeah. $1 and not free. Yeah. So, uh, everyone should cool. check it out. I think it's a really interesting read. And it was, uh, I like Top Cow Pilot Season, and I'm excited for it to be republished to Image now. So, it'll be cool. Uh, Joe, what do you want to read this week? I'm going to vote for Creature Tech. Because right. I almost brought it myself. Okay. Uh, genius. Nice. Genius. I'm going to vote for Creature Tech. Me too. All right. That's, that's my jam. I was like, if you vote for something other than Creature Tech, I'm going to come across this table. <laughs> it's not here anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm really excited. I want to read it. It sounds great. So let's check it out. Oh, right, it's I an read this book, isn't it? like 12 years ago. My copy, right? Uh, I think it was Tyler's copy. Mm. Uh, Tyler probably read your copy and then went out and bought it. <laughs> Actually, if I recall, that is exactly what happened. Is that yeah. cool. what I did? Well, all right, Creature Tech for next time. We'll yep. catch you guys next week. Keep an eye out for our Patreon stuff, yep. and uh, we'll what, see you then. What right. you? Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to me from the gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.